I can feel you in the morning sun. I can see you in the sky above. I can hear you in the gentle breeze. You are always in all ways with me. I can feel you in the morning sun. I can see you in the sky above. I can hear you in the gentle breeze. You are always in all ways with me. Never a moment that you are far from my heart. You're always, you're always in all ways with me. I can feel you in the morning sun. I can see you in the sky above. I can hear you in the gentle breeze. You are always in all ways with me. Never a moment that you are far from my heart. You're always. You're always in all ways with me. I can feel you in the morning sun. I can hear you in the sky above. I can hear you. In the gentle breeze, you are always in all ways with me. Thank you, Susan. You're always and in all ways with me. And as we begin this service, I just want to welcome all of you here this morning. You know, David loved music. I can't tell you how many times we heard him playing this piano. He'd be in a class, and we'd be on break, and he'd sneak in, and he was playing He was playing his music. So I just want to welcome you. I'm Reverend Lisa Davis, Senior Minister here at Unity Spiritual Center of Portland, and I'd like to welcome you to this celebration of life, an opportunity to recognize that there's a shift. There's a, there's a shift in the form and the shape and the idea and the essence of, of this beautiful being we've known as David, or Dave, or, you know, however we've known him, and, and to hold the space of love as we wish him well along this sacred journey that his soul is on. You know, Rumi is a 13th century um, Sufi mystic and a poet who, he wrote about death frequently, and some of the things he said, you know, he kept saying, there's no separation, there's no loss, it's just a shift, and he said, the world is a playground, and death is the night. It's the sleeping. It's the movement. And he said, die happily and look forward to taking up a new and better form. Like the sun, only when you set in the west can you rise in the east. And I just think about that as far as a, a sacred journey that a being's on. And so we're going to open in prayer. And whatever tradition you come from, whatever that ground of being is for you, I just invite you to open to that God of your understanding as we just anchor this in this. And so we just say, Mother, Father, God, infinite spirit, we open. We open to a welcoming, a welcoming of this shift and a deeper understanding of this movement, the sacred journey of life that each of us are on and that this beautiful, beautiful soul, David, that he has taken, he has lived, and he has continued along that sacred journey. We recognize that, 
this essence, this light lives and moves and has its being within the very presence and that presence of oneness, of love, of life. The opportunity to gather and to celebrate the journey. For that opportunity, we are so grateful. And so it is. Amen. All right. And we have a reading. Robert, you're going to come up and share with us? That'd be great. The Traveler. He has put on invis invisibility. Dear Lord, I cannot see. But this I know, although the road ascends and passes from my sight, that there will be no night, that you will take him gently by the hand and lead him on. You will, along the road of life that never ends, and he will find it is not death, but dawn. I do not doubt that you are here and as here, and you will hold him dear. Our life will not begin, did not begin with birth. It is not of the earth. And this that we call death, it is no more than the opening and closing of a door. And in your house, how many rooms must be beyond this one where we rest moment, momently? Dear Lord, I thank you for the faith that frees, the love that knows it cannot lose its own, the love that, looking through the shadows, sees that you and I and he are ever one. a part of you you're a part of me together living out the script of history you and me are walking one another home there's a part of me there's a part of you there's a part of God in everything we see and do. Together we are walking one another home. Since the dawn of time, there is a great light. It is guiding us and calling us back home. We are a part of all that is, everything that was. We're walking on this journey back to where we're from. Take my hand, we're walking one another home. Since the dawn of time, there is a great light. It is guiding us and calling us back home. We are a part of all that is, everything that was. We're walking on this journey back to where we're from. Take my hand, we're walking one another home. Since the dawn of time, there is a great light. It is guiding us and calling us back home. We are a part of all that is, everything that was. We're walking on this journey back to where we're from. Take my hand. We're walking one another home. You and me are walking one another home. Welcome back. We are finally coming
Thank you, thank you. We are walking one another home. You know, one of the greatest challenges we meet is this challenge of change. And probably the greatest change we ever see is this change we call death. We look at it and we say, wow, what is this? Why is this? Why did it have to be now? What's happening? And, and I just invite you as you move into to this journey of, of shifting and, and hopefully enlarging the way we see the world and, and how we view David as you know, the body that, that he was, the being that he was, and, and enlarge that view to an idea of a soul that continues on. You know, he's put aside this space suit, and yet we love that space suit. That's what I call it. Everybody's welcome. There's nothing I can tell anybody. I don't have the answers. All I can do is share ideas. But the space suit, we get, we get so attached to the space suit that sometimes we forget what really draws us and what connects us is the light behind those eyes. It's the essence of the being. And, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said, um, in the midst of death, Life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. We can, this form can change, and it wasn't the way that we, that we saw it a month ago or two months ago or, or years ago. And so it changes, and we work to, to, to find a way to move within that. And yet... If you look at science, we get to realize that no energy is ever lost. You can ask a quantum physicist. In fact, I used to hear the joke, you know, I wish a physicist would do my funeral, my, my service, because they'd say it's never lost. And so while the, we let go of a, of a body, of a spacesuit, the light that we are continues on that journey. And, and you know, the conservation of that energy and that essence and, and the celebration that we can have for the way that light touched our lives really begins to remember the connection that we have. And sometimes we don't fully realize what, what a being taught us until they've let that spacesuit go. And then we realize, oh my gosh, I learned about kindness. I learned about caring. I learned about never giving up, even when I didn't have the answers myself. You know, here at Unity, David came and he was so quiet for probably the first year, just, you know, just quietly attending, often asking for prayer, saying, you know, I'm just trying to go through where I am and I'm hurting. And, and, and then he started taking classes and we got to know him. And one of the things I know was he was always so kind to every being. He would look at someone, he'd talk to someone, and he would see them. And you know, when he wasn't working part of the time during the pandemic, he, he showed up one day and just said, okay, I'm here to work. I don't wanna sit in my place, I wanna do something, tell me what I can do to help. And he would do whatever it was, and if he couldn't find anything to do, he'd come and play the piano, and just, just making it a better atmosphere. And also, some of the things I learned from him was he never gave up. He was searching. I don't know how much of his life, but I know the life I knew and recognized and, and got to have a, quite a few talks with him. He took classes with me. He took classes with um, one of our other ministers, Reverend Sidney, at the time. And he would just share the struggle he had in believing in himself and finding the value and worth. And yet... That journey as we watched him do that struggle and, and move on. And, you know, towards the last few months, he found a peace that I hadn't seen before. And he'd come in with a smile. And he'd find a little more of himself. And I realized he was working to find the value and the worth in who he was just as he was. And it's so interesting because that's the human journey. That's the journey. We're all, from our point of view, we're all spiritual beings having a human experience. And that human experience is finding ways that we can find our value and worth and be able to show up just as we are. I want to read you a poem called There Is No Death. It says, I am standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and I watch her. 
until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and the sky come together to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side said, there, she's gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that's all. She is just as large and massed and whole and spar as she was when she left my side. And she is just as able to bear her load of living weight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. And just at the moment when someone at my side says, there, she's gone. There are other eyes watching her coming and other voices taking up the glad shout. There she comes. And that's dying. For there truly is no death in God. And... Uh, you know, as I looked again and again at David's human experience and, and the, both the gifts he brought and he taught with, and then I looked at where he was along that journey, I realized that he could still show up every day. Anybody had trouble showing up in life sometimes and saying, I don't want it to be right here. He was willing to show up right where he was, the things he understood and didn't understand, and, and to meet what was there and to, to continue that journey. You know, many of us here are missing him. I am. I miss him greatly. I appreciated the, the spirit that came with him, the, the essence and that so gentleness that always traveled with him. And then I get to remember, you know, it's okay to grieve. It's not a disorder. It's a part of a journey of healing. It's, it's simply, you know, the, the only cure for grief is to grieve to feel the sadness of, of missing a being and yet to honor the soul that we love so much. In the Eastern traditions, they talk about the idea that every being, every soul teaches us in their comings and in their goings. And that if we can accept those learnings and those teachings, we're empowered and we are enlightened. And so the idea that, that every being has come into our life for a purpose and a reason and that we can learn from them is one of the great gifts I find when I say, how do I move through the changes? How do I, how do I walk with the sadness of wanting the being and yet recognizing every soul knows what it's doing in my belief? That soul says, I've made this life journey. It's time for me to go. And I've tried to convince people they're here to stay. They're not going. And the truth is, every soul chooses its journey. Carolyn Mace wrote a book called Sacred Contracts. And in her belief, before we enter this, this life experience, we make sacred contracts to heal, to learn, to grow, and to teach. And when we're done with the ones we made, we have an opportunity to continue on and to, and to go on. And I want to read to you something from Ernest Holmes on grief and loss. And he said, and he was a, a spiritual teacher, and he said, it is human to grieve the loss of dear ones. We love them and cannot help missing them. But a true realization of the immortality and continuity of the individual soul will rob our grief of hopelessness. We shall realize that they are in God's keeping and they are safe. We, sh we shall know that loving friends have met them and that their life flows on with the currents of eternity. We shall eventually, and he put that in parentheses, eventually feel that we have not lost them. They have only gone before. So we shall view eternity from the highest standpoint as a continuity of time forever and ever expanding until time as we now experience it shall be no more. Time heals all wounds, adjusts all conditions, explains facts, and time alone satisfies the expanding soul, reconciling the visible and the invisible. We are born of eternal day, and the spiritual suns shall never set upon the glory of the soul, for it is the coming forth of God into expression. You know, Jesus talked about the idea, you know, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Also believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. 
And so as he's let us, you know, left aside this garment of flesh, his soul continues on. And it's the inner qualities that will continue with us that we can feel and know and, and have a, a part of us. And with that, that's where spirit is present and available. And so I would invite you as during this service, I would just invite you to say, what did I learn? What did he teach me? What did that light that we know as David? And, and you may have said, well, I didn't always see the light. We learn in all times. Sometimes we learn in the darkest times more than we learn when there's plenty of light. But what did I learn? What did it teach me? And when we find that, we can also say, how do I honor a life? I honor that life by incorporating those teachings into my life. I find that I can honor this being and say yes as he continues on to that, to that essence. I know that David's greatest desire was to find inner peace. And that was so important to him. He read about it. He studied about it. He looked at his life, and when things didn't look peaceful and he didn't find that peace, he'd go deeper. He went into counseling. He went into different pieces. He just said, I'm going to find this. And I found that as I watched him this year, I was like, wow, there's another level of peace. He's found another answer to his story. There's another piece here. And I realized that courage is something that I learned from. And so our journey and our opportunity right now is to celebrate a life, both remembering the special times we've had and then to hold out our hands and our hearts, recognize we're still connected in spirit. You know, we never lose another being. We're never not connected. If you look at the idea of us living in, in energy and in quantum in a quantum field, we're always connected. Every being is connected. And the ability to recognize that connection and to honor it and to allow it to begin to live in us and to realize as humanity, as Ram Dass said, we are always walking each other home. That's what humanity is learning to do. Then we find such a different way and a different essence. And so I just invite you to say yes to that celebration of a life and the honoring of a spirit that said, this is who I am. I believe in me, and I'm going to find a way to love myself and know I'm worthy. And we are going to um, spend a little bit of time right now. Kevin's going to come up and share some ideas with us. My name is Kevin Curry. I'm the, the eldest brother David was born on September 9th, 1967, the, um, to, to William and Mary Curry. Many of you know that. He was the fourth of six children. Uh, he was actually the eldest of the twins by about 18 minutes. Um, his siblings are Kevin, Maureen, Patrick, Brian, and Robert. He was born in St. Vincent's Hospital, where he would grow up to work following his mom, um, who also worked there. He also worked. Uh, well, he worked as an emergency room registrar and also worked uh, at OHSU's internal medicine clinic. He attended Holy Trinity Grade School, Jesuit High School, uh, Portland State, earned a bachelor's degree in psychology, a minor in political science. Those are the facts. But who was David and really what was he all about? He loved children. He loved children. It was clear when Julie and I had children, we went and we visited, we brought the kids by, and he was the one who spent time with the children. He was the one that was kind. He was the one that spent time and was really, really interested in them. Um, he even later worked at a daycare center, which I thought was very, very impressive. Who else was he? He was opinionated and, and stubborn and brilliant, many, many things. Um, what did he love? He loved his books. Um, he was fascinated by history, intrigued by politics, and really driven to, to read about health and, and self-improvement. He was hurt in several accidents, and so he spent a lot of time just trying to learn to understand, to, to relieve some of the physical pain that, uh, that he experienced. 
What was he passionate about? He was passionate about music. Reverend Lisa talked about that. He was crazy about music. Piano, his, his keyboard. Um, that keyboard was an extension of him. It absolutely was. He composed music. Sometimes he didn't like even know he was composing music, and it just plain happened. He came to our house where there was a piano. He also happened to come to the local family pub where there also was a piano. And um, it was like a magnet. It was just drawing him and pulling him and, and drawing to it. And it was so funny because he never played for a long time, but um, it was like he was greeting a, a new friend, meeting a new friend, or greeting an old one. Very short, how are you doing? And then the, the, the playing stopped. It was just like an old friend that he would talk to. And then he moved on. But oh, how he was totally energized by that piano. You know that. Um, we did find piles and piles of sheet music in his apartment, and we're really hoping to find a good home for that, for, for that uh, piano music, that sheet music. What else? You'll see in the slideshow in a, in a few minutes, um, you'll, you'll see him partaking in a communal garden that he had in northwest Portland. Uh, some people would say it was scraggly and, and weedy and a little, a little small, a little, a little tacky. But uh, they might have said that. They might have. But he was so proud of that garden, which you'll see in a, in a few minutes. It meant a lot to him to grow the, the vegetables and the tomatoes and, and the lettuce. Very, very meaningful for him. To your point, what, what did I learn? What did we learn from David? Um, a lot of things. Don't get so busy that you lose touch. Check in on people. Material possessions are utterly meaningless. And be generous of your time and your being for others. What did he leave behind? A family that loved him and misses him deeply. Thank you, Kevin. You know, I want to share with you um, something that one of our chaplains wrote. She's a she is both a hospice um, trainer and she um, also is a Unity Prayer Chaplain. And Colleen's story, and she said, "I'll be honest. When I heard of Dave's death, my reaction was one of great sorrow, followed by a sense of gratitude." And she said, let me explain. I met David at Unity Spiritual Center of Portland, where I serve as a prayer chaplain. And he would often seek me out for prayers, even though I wasn't on duty. And Dave and I got to know each other. What I learned from sitting and, and praying and talking with Dave was that he was a beautiful spiritual being who struggled to see his own beauty and worth. Dave struggled to find where he fit in this world. But sitting with Dave, I was able to see past those struggles and see the true essence of who he was. He was kindness. He was caring. He was thoughtful. He, he was so much. And she, and she went on to say he saw beauty all around him. Anyone who listened to him play the piano could feel the divine energy that flowed through him. You cannot play so beautifully with such passion without it radiating through your being. Dave was soft-spoken. He was kind. He also held a vision of himself and his future that was peaceful, beautiful, and full of love. Though for reasons he shared, he felt it was just out of his reach. There is, that is where my gratitude comes in. Dave, you are now free to be that beautiful, loving, radiating spirit being that you knew you were somewhere deep down inside. With this transition comes your freedom to express the divinity you have always been. My intellect acknowledges the sadness, but my heart soars besides yours celebrating you. And I just thought that was a beautiful way of seeing it. And we have a slideshow and some music. And after that, we, I'm going to invite any of you who would like to share a story of how David touched your life. Or, you know, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's whatever it is. But just we'll do that after this. In this moment, 
in this place I remember who I am letting fear and worry fall away from me I open my eyes and see there is only love there is only Love that sets us free There is only love Letting fear and worry fall away from me I open my eyes and see there is only love there is only love love that heals love that sets us free there is only There is only love, love that heals, love that sets us free. There is only How beautiful. So we just want to open it up. Is there anybody? We have a microphone here. Is there anybody who would like to share a story or a thought or a way that David touched your life? I'm Kathy McNeil. I'm Neil's wife. Um, I didn't know David real well, but the few times that I did meet him, kindness was the overriding feeling that I got from him. We would run into him at St. Vincent's in the admitting department because uh, Neil had an uncle that, that was one of his favorite places to visit, so we would uh, go and be with him and help him, and he was always a kind smile and a helpful person for us when we were going through those times and I appreciate him and when I found out that he had died at such a young age I thought I was glad that I got to know him and that he was a really sweet man. Anybody else? So um, I didn't know I knew him as Dave, not David. And um, I didn't know him for very long, uh, about a year. Uh, the one thing I knew about him, though, was that he was definitely trying to find that peace that you had stated. But I think in the last few months, he was really finding it. One thing that... Um, uh, this is Melinda, by the way. We're, we're both, work, we worked with him and we're his bosses. <laughs> um, but one thing that we tried to do was help our employees with morale. And one of the things Dave absolutely loved was the therapy dogs that would come in. Uh, I still have a picture, actually, in my phone of Dave on the ground with one of the dogs. <laughs> uh, 
And it just, we could feel the turmoil in him, but we could see the sense of peace taking over him. And whenever a dog came in, that peace definitely <laughs> prevailed. So um, I'm just going to take away from Dave some, some good lessons um, because I think everybody comes into our lives to bring us those. And Kevin, what you said about material things are worthless is very true. And I saw it in Dave a lot. Dixie, Dixie, you want to go in the back? Um, my name's Tim, and uh, I was, um, I'm proud that uh, Dave was my best friend in grade school, a great friend in high school. Um, growing up, we had a few firsts together. Um, first beer after my parents had a St. Patrick's Day party. Keg wasn't uh, empty yet, so Dave and I helped ourselves. A cigarette behind Tan is born. His dad knew we did because he went and picked us up and we didn't think a cigarette would smell, but it did. Um, watching Oregon State basketball, Portland Trailblazer basketball, we thought we'd uh, be one one day. Um, but Kevin, you're right, David had a um, way about connecting with people very um, humbly, but with pride. And you, you could tell when you were welcomed um, into his world through grade school and high school. Um, and it's one of those things where you don't always have the opportunity to say thank you. So if I had the opportunity to tell David, I'd say thank you for um, your friendship. Thank you for making me smarter because I never made him smarter. Um, thank you for uh, all the competitive sporting games. Sorry, uh, Brian and Rob, that, you know, he was tough on you at times when we played. <laughs> um, and I'd also just say thank you to the family because I was over there a lot. I think sometimes my parents would wonder if I was ever going to come home. But I was always welcome. Um, there was always plenty of pancakes and bacon on the table growing up. And uh, so with that, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the friendship and uh, who he helped me become uh, along the way. I'm Brian. I'm the twin. Um, I'd like to correct you, Tim. First cigarette was in third grade. We were eight. <laughs> yeah, Rob was there too, by the way. Um, I also want to remind you, Tim, on the time that we, uh, us, the criminal masterminds that we were, we egged the house from across the street while the guy was standing out front. Not one of our most winning, you know, decisions. Um, Dave and I, I believe, got a police record out of that. Yeah. For vandalism. That, that guy was kind of mean. Um, I wish that I really would have followed up on talking to him more. Um, missed that opportunity. So, bye. Hi, my name is Lynn, and I had the opportunity to talk to David a number of times because he would come forward asking for prayer, or when he was in classes, um, you could tell he was intently listening, and that feels pretty awesome um, when you know that somebody is drinking in and learning and understanding or seeking understanding. And he was extremely good at that. Um, and I also just wanted to add that uh, I know when David would help and come into the church to help, that our administrator was like, oh, David's 
here again today. Oh, this is wonderful. He's so helpful. So um, he was he was very much appreciated. So thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll keep going. You know, one of the things I do remember is he, he usually read the book before the class, the whole thing, and then he, he wouldn't ask a lot of questions in class, but he'd wait till afterwards. And then he'd say, you know, on, on page 58, it said this. What do you think about that? And could it be this? And, could it, and it, was, it was really fun. But when he'd come in here and play, there was one of the times when literally he didn't even know I was in the room because he was so absorbed in playing with his whole passion and heart and self. And he got done, and I said, wow. And he goes, I feel better. And then I said, did you write that? And he thought about it, and he goes, I don't know. And they looked, he goes, I guess I did. He didn't even realize, he said he just allowed spirit was the word we use. He just allowed something to come through him and to create through him. And I realized that's what he was doing in the garden. That's what he wanted to do in life. And, and what a gift he taught me of just getting so absorbed that he didn't even know if it was his or someone else's. He couldn't see that shift. And, you know, part of healing when we are looking to learn from someone's life journey and what they share with us is sharing with each other, talking about where we were and what happened and what we learned and what we didn't learn. And, you know, I think perhaps the reason for sadness and, and grief at a time such as this is we feel like there's nothing more we can do. I don't know how to touch them. I, maybe I didn't do it enough or I didn't, you know, I want to do more and I want to do things. And, and I believe that we can express our love and our gratitude and give something in return by accepting the challenge of our life, of not giving up in our life, of having the courage to keep going even when. And I mean, you know, with, with Dave, I saw it year after year after year. He just did not give up. And he wanted to know more. He wanted to understand the big questions of life. And, and he, that idea that we can take that challenge and say, whatever's in my life is there to teach me. And we can remember that no one passes beyond the power of prayer and love. Prayer is a language of spirit, and love is a language of prayer. And so whatever your beliefs are, there's still an essence and an, and an eternal energy that is the ground of being. And, and David has passed through this earthly experience much richer than when his soul came in, when that being came in and, and announced to the world, I'm here. And, and so, because he bears with him all the tra treasures of the soul that he gathered along the way, every act of kindness, every act of unselfishness, every act of generosity, of courage, of thoughtfulness, of service, of whatever he was doing, it's enriched him, it's equipped him better as he continues on this way. And so we just get to say thank you. Thank you, Spirit. And we're going to um, close this time together. You know, I'm, I'm looking at um, the ashes here. And I just hold that space, that, that beautiful being that we knew as Dave. And, and, you know, that we can bless that as it returns to the earth. And that we can bless the soul that he is and continues to be in that light. Accept it it into our being and bless it along its journey. And so I just, we end this service with the idea that, that Dave, the light of God surrounds you, the love of God enfolds you, the power of God protects you, the presence of God watches over you. Wherever you are, God is, and all is well. We love you. Amen. We thank you for being here. All right.
Have a wonderful week. Thank you.